Uh, speaker, I would like to introduce Jogo Wang. Uh, he will uh, give a talk on emission-free hydrogen and novel carbon nanotubes production by catalytic decomposition of light, light paraffins. Uh, Jogo is with the uh, consortium of the fossil fuel science in Lexington and the University of Kentucky. a small switch on the side here. Well, good morning. Um, I'm happy to have this chance to update the uh, progress of hydrogen production in the uh, consortium of fossil fuel science. The title of this presentation is uh, Hydrogen and uh, Nanotube Production by Catalytic Decomposition of uh, Light Patterns. Uh, this is the outline of uh, my presentation. First is the introduction. I will talk a little bit about uh, the big picture of uh, what drives the uh, hydrogen production. And then we talk a little bit about the catalyst we use in the hydrogen production and I'll show you the GC results and TEM observations we have so far. And uh, then I will draw some conclusions from that and a uh, little bit from the, for the future work of plants. There are, this is the uh, several factors I believe that uh, driving the uh, current uh, hydrogen production research. In the next five, 10 years, the demand of hydrogen is expected to increase due to the following reasons. One is the EPA regulation that requires the desulfurization of petroleum-based fuels in refineries. The other is the DOE has, renounced, uh, has announced the plan of a future giant freedom car. Both of these projects are related to the hydrogen production and the increased demand of hydrogen. The third fact is very important because the president is going to put mon more money in the hydrogen production. And during his uh, State of the Union address, he said, and tonight I'm proposing 1.2 billion in research funding so that America can lead the world in developing clean hydrogen-powered automobiles. So that's why we do this research, to trying to get more money for the, our program. This, <laughs> this slide tells you the uh, different routes of hydrogen production as you have already seen in the previous presentation, uh, I'd like to mention this briefly and quickly. The uh, traditional way of uh, hydrogen production involves either the steam reforming or the partial oxidation. But this is a multi-step of production of hydrogen and followed by the water gas shape reaction and different methods of purification and separation. <coughs> because of the CO is very poisonous to the catalyst using a few cells. And the other way, or another alternative, is to produce the hydrogen by direct non-oxidative uh, decomposition of hydrocarbons. And this is a one-step process, and this is what we use in the uh, generation of hydrogen. The catalyst employed, we're using the nanoscale binary iron-based catalyst supported on high-surface aluminum. The preparation method is nothing uh, mysterious. It's just by the incipient awareness and co-precipitation of uh, the uh, uh, co-precipitation. So, um, the catalyst before use, we proceeded with the hydrogen uh, with a 50 ml flow for two hours at 700 degree, and the uh, X-ray adsorption fine structures and the most power spectroscopy has identified two things that are very important for the uh, uh, catalyst activity. One is the crossonite, which helps binding the uh, catalyst particle on the surface of alumina. The other thing is the, are the non-magnetic metallic oil alloys, the uh, austenite, the ionic carbide, ion platinum carbide, 
and possibly Imoli carbide austenite, which is a fish sanded cube. And uh, before the inflowing of the uh, reactant gas or reactant liquid, the reactor was flushed with the nitrogen to remove any residue or uh, hydrogen in the reactor. Uh, now let's take a look at the results and uh, some of the things we want to discuss. There are two kinds of studies we carried out. One is to see the temperature effect. At different temperatures, the, the product distribution are different. The other is the time on stream study to see the uh, catalyst durability and the deactivation of the catalyst. Uh, as many of you may have already seen this before, this is the uh, uh, what we did in the last uh, two or three years, this is the decomposition of methane, and this slide tells you the uh, uh, temperature effect for different catalysts. The uh, blue line is the uh, platinum ion, the red is the moly ion, the green is the nickel ion, and the uh, uh, shallow yellow is an ion, uh, pure ion catalyst or alumina, and uh, that one is the non-catalytic one. So. From this graph, you can see for the same amount of hydrogen production, we see a, a large a lower of the temperature uh, for the same amount of hydrogen production. We have the, the uh, decrease of about 450 to 500 degree of temperature in producing the same amount of uh, uh, hydrogen. The other thing I want to point out is that the iron or alumina by itself is not as effective as the other binary catalysts for the producing of uh, hydrogen. So, next is the, uh, non the cracking of the ethane. This is the slide that tells you the uh, products at different temperatures. Uh, as you can see, as the temperature increases, the amount of hydrogen increases, and at the initial stage, we have some uh, uh, ethylene uh, products and some methane, but as temperature goes over uh, a certain range, in this case, in our uh, reaction condition, after 900 degree, we do not see any ethylene. The only products are hydrogen and methane. The increase of the uh, hydrogen amount is due to the uh, decomposition of uh, uh, methane and uh, ethylene. And again, we see that the uh, starting temperature uh, is about uh, 800 degrees for the significant amount of hydrogen production. Now, this slide is compared with the uh, non-catalytic uh, ethane cracking and the catalytic ethane cracking, and that double arrow shows you the, uh, for the same amount of hydrogen production, the temperature difference. For the catalytic route, we have around 550 degrees for the non-catalytic route, it's about 820 degrees. So we have about 300 degree uh, temperature lowering for the, uh, uh, compared with the non-catalytic cracking. And this temperature is comparable to the traditional steep, steep reforming. Now, that's what we did. Uh, this slide show you what we did uh, in the last, uh, uh, the past half a year the cracking of the propane. For the non-catalytic crack, uh, catalytic cracking of propane, we have the products of hydrogen, methane, ethylene, and ethane at the initial stage. As the temperature goes over uh, about 575, uh, we see the uh, we see the uh, large increase of the uh, hydrogen uh, production. And also, at uh, about 700 degree, we see the uh, decrease of uh, the uh, ethylene and uh, the uh, methane production keeps about the same, and a little bit decrease of ethane. And the hydrogen production keeps increasing because of the further decomposition of the uh, uh, other products like uh, the ethylene and ethane. Well, this is a catalytic cracking of propane by the nickel ion catalyst and compared with the uh, non-catalytic route we did not see any uh, significant amount of the ethylene and the ethane and uh, at uh, about 
at about uh, 175, the only products of hydrogen and uh, methane. So uh, the complete decomposition happens uh, for uh, the conversion for the problem happens at around 475 degree and compared with the non-catalytic one we have about 200 to 250 degree lower uh, conversion. <laughs> this is a time out stream study uh, for the uh, propane uh, conversion. So for the the pink is for the moly ion and the uh, red is for the nickel ion. Uh, in agreement with, with, with our previous study, we see these two catalysts have very good activity for the long period up to about six hours. Um, the one thing we notice is different from the other round uh, with the ethane and methane. We see the uh, palladium uh, ion catalyst uh, activity decrease after about one hour and ten minutes. Uh, we're still investigating this uh, phenomena by doing some um, most power spectroscopy. We think because maybe because of the uh, incomplete reduction and the uh, formation of that austenite is not complete. So, in agreement with the previous run for the ethane and the methane, the pure ion catalyst for the blue line uh, deactivates very fast. Now, this is the uh, result for the uh, <coughs> catalytic quacking of cyclohexane with the nickel ion catalyst. Uh, because we're running cyclohexane, you might expect to see a lot of benzene production. Um, but for our reaction condition, the major products are the methane and the hydrogen, and benzene is at most about uh, uh, three volume percent. And at about the temperature of 475, we have the maximum production of benzene, but it's still just about three percent. And uh, at about 500 degree, I did not observe any benzene in the outgoing uh, flow gas. So, this is a time out stream study of cyclohexane at 475 degree. Um, for the first one hour, we see the catalyst uh, so very st stable. Um, after about one hour, because of the uh, production of nanotube and the uh, catalyst bed uh, is blocked with those nanotubes. So, so the uh, flow of the cyclohexane through the catalytic bed is not as accurate as we previously said. And again, we see that at this temperature, uh, the major uh, product is methane, hydrogen, and the benzene is about 3% uh, percent of volume. So the observations uh, we have from the uh, hydrogen production is that the non-catalytic quaking valves produce uh, uh, more olefins and for the, uh, we're not very sure about why it produces more uh, unsaturated hydrocarbons. We have some uh, gas, maybe it's a, some oxidative mechanisms happen because for the oxidative dehydrogenation of a propene, we got uh, propene. We did not observe any propene in our product. For the catalytic route, the hardening um, production begins really about 400 degree and uh, at, uh, above, at the temperatures that are above 600 degree, we see more hydrogen production due to the further decomposition of methane. And the other thing we observe is that the, the binary metal catalyst remain active for much longer time than the mono uh, metallic ion catalyst. Now that's about the hydrogen production. The other thing we observed from this catalytic decomposition of light paraffin is the production of carbon nanotubes. For the uh, ethane round with the moly catalyst at 650, we observe this parallel wall co-concentric uh, 
uh, cylindrical uh, nanotube. This is a very conventional type. You see the walls are parallel to each other. They are cold, concentric. And, uh, but at a low temperature, for the decomposition of undiluted ethane, we see this low type of uh, uh, nanotubes because it looks like the track of the coins stacked uh, over one another. And with this uh, side openings, with this open structure, uh, we uh, think it might have the uh, higher uh, hardness storage ca capacity. The initial result uh, by our collaboration with the National Energy Technology Lab shows that this is a very promising material for the hydrogen storage. That's from the uh, uh, ethane run. And again, from the propane run, uh, at the lower temperature, around 475 degrees, we observe this traffic core type of uh, nanotube again. Um, at a high temperature, you see the very nice the parallel wall, the uh, nanotubes for the uh, decomposition of the propane. So why is that a different temperature? We have different shape of uh, nanotubes. We're not really sure for the time being, but we do know that it is temperature uh, related. And also for the uh, uh, gasoline rich compound, cyclohexane, at a low temperature, again, we uh, observe this traffic current type of uh, nanotubes. So here's what we observed for the uh, nanotube production. The different forms of molten water carbon nanotubes growing at different temperatures. At around 450 degrees, we have this nested coin stacked over one another, graphitic place open at the edges, and pro providing more uh, <coughs> holes for the uh, uh, hydrogen to go in if it is used for hydrogen storage material. At around 650 degrees, the concentric hollow cylinders, similar to the nanotubes, uh, uh, produced from methane decomposition. And uh, uh, one thing I need to point out is that for the methane, at a low temperature, we did not observe the uh, traffic cone type of nanotubes. Um, uh, from uh, what we observed, uh, we have a couple of conclusions. Uh, one is the uh, catalyst. The catalyst, uh, binary catalyst, is much more <coughs> active uh, than the uh, uh, monometallic uh, uh, catalyst. The other thing that is uh, the temperature effect for the production of nanotubes. At the low temperature, we have the uh, uh, traffic corn type of nanotube. At uh, high temperature, we have the parallel wall uh, nanotube. And uh, that is definitely uh, related uh, to the temperature. The other thing is that uh, from the initial data we have so far, I, I didn't show it here, this normal structure nanotube tube is very promising for the hydrogen storage. And uh, finally, uh, we would like to thank the U.S. Department of Energy for giving us the money to run the hydrogen production program. Um, Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, two questions, please. Uh, one is, do uh, you have a feeling for closing the mass balance on this one? There's obviously a lot of carbon that's been deposited because you have such a high yield of uh, hydrogen and methane, which is also hydrogen rich in the case where you do it the non-catalytic way. And the second question is, what is the sort of purity of the nanotube component of the carbon, so would you also have some amorphous carbon? At uh, this specific temperature, we did not observe a large amount of amorphous carbon. The first question, uh, no detailed balance, uh, mass balance is calculated, but for the outer flowing, uh, outer going gas flowing, uh, the uh, uh, mass balance is done based on the collaboration if we add up to 100%. Question, uh, you will, uh, since you were mentioning the possibility to use these new nano, multi-wall nano 
tubes for hydrogen storage. I was wondering, have you done any um, measurements of the D spacings and compared them with the nanotubes that have this very straight line and uncapped or, or just one cap? Uh, not yet. And uh, for the spacing, uh, we haven't done any work about it. And uh, just trying to measure the, the uh, hydrogen uptake. And the initial result shows that uh, we have a large uh, uptake of hydrogen. Do you have any results on hydrogen that absorption of the say that you can use this nanotube <coughs> for hydrogen storage. But how do you release the hydrogen? Uh, no, I don't, I don't have it with me. What do you think would be the route to get the hydrogen back? You store the hydrogen in nanotubes, but how do you get it back if you want to use it? Uh, I'm not really sure, and uh, I'm not in that specific area of hydrogen storage. Um, I see from the uh, device, I see just one time is by uh, applying the high pressure to get the hydrogen into the nanotubes. And how you release that, uh, definitely one way is when you lower the, the pressure, the hydrogen is going to come out. And that's based on what I've seen, I can tell you. But other than that, um, some other technologies to get the hydrogen out, here you go. What, 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 what is the color of your nanotube? Black? Black, yes. Yes. <laughs> John. Yes. Um, it's a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, obviously, you don't have a CO2 emission and environmental concern, but uh, just looking at the uh, amount of hydrogen produced from, say, methane, you, you form a lot of carbon. Uh, it seems to me that there's excess amount of carbon uh, back at the anvil of calculations about uh, for a small fuel cell system you can form over 70 kilograms of carbon per day. Um, that seems to be more than you can uh, uh, consume as a hydrogen storage. So uh, do you have any thoughts about what would happen to all this carbon that's produced? Just uh, What would happen to this carbon? You're making so much hydrogen uh, I'm not really sure if I understand it correctly. <coughs> I mean, what we should do to deal with this uh, carbon production, right? Yes. Uh, the uh, interesting thing is that uh, we have these nanotubes to be used for the hydrogen storage. And other than that, people have been asking this question: you know, What are you going to do with this high, uh, carbon if this is just uh, carbon black or amorphous carbon. But here we have this nanotube probably uh, offer some uh, valuable uh, material for hydrogen storage. And if it is just amorphous carbon, uh, then it's, it is disadvantage. Just like still reforming and partial oxidation, what are you going to do with the CO? Uh, you, you do the water gas shift reaction, you, you, then you do the purification process. So everything has its advantage and good uh, disadvantage. So I believe this might be one of the disadvantages, but it's advantage we're looking at. We're not focusing on its disadvantage. So it's uh, the uh, hydrogen production is one step and it's a high purity of hydrogen. Iron. You uh, showed the activity of iron by itself. What, what do you think the activity of moly, palladium, or nickel by itself would be? And what, what, do you, what are your thoughts as to the mechanism for the bimetallic uh, activity? Why, why is the addition of a second metal make, it, make the iron more active? Uh, we see the, uh, by the most power spectroscopy and uh, X-ray absorption fine structure, we see the austenite phase is the active phase. Uh, that probably is the reason why the uh, bimetallic catalyst is more active. In the uh, moly, plating the nickel by themselves? Uh, we haven't tried that, but I know the nickel or silica uh, can also produce some uh, carbon nanotubes. And for the decomposition, 
uh, a Japanese group used that to produce uh, hydrogen and methane. Very active. They did the work from the uh, lower carbon uh, number of hydrocarbon to uh, octane. After octane, the uh, uh, hydrogen production is very well, and the selectivity of hydrogen increases with the carbon num number. And that's with the nickel and silicon. But we haven't tried just pure nickel or aluminum for our candies. Uh, yeah. where, where exactly is the, the nanotube formed? Is it formed on the catalyst surface or downstream? Uh, the nanotube actually growing away from the catalyst particle. So if the catalyst particle, as I said, the first line helps to bind the catalyst particle on the surface of aluminum. If this is the surface of the aluminum, the nanotube is going this way. So it's, it's retained within the catalyst. That, that's right. The, the catalyst particle retains on the surface of aluminum. Once it uh, goes away from the surface, the activity for nanotube production is lost. That's what we observed so far from the uh, most bio spectroscopy and uh, the x -fars. Thank you. Uh, you uh, make two valuable products, one the hydrogen, one the nanotube, and it uh, seems the nanotube is more valuable than hydrogen. So it depends on where your money comes from. I think you're probably going to be promoting the nanotube into the hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> so the hydrogen is the far part, and the nanotube actually be the uh, main product. But that is, uh, 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 is that uh, the system you only can operate a couple hours? So you think that after a couple hours, that's fine? Like, about it. Well, it depends on the, the uh, type of a reactor you are using. And uh, if it is a fixed battery reactor, the growth of carbon nanotubes uh, may call the reactor and uh, also the, uh, the, uh, if they pass a certain amount of time, some of the particles will go away from the surface of the uh, catalyst. That will lose the activity for the uh, production of both hydrogen and nanotubes. But if you apply some other possible technologies, probably it's going to run for a long, long time. <laughs> and I, I see some people using the uh, free dyes the bad. It's going to run a very long time. What is the methane conversion with uh, the high conversion? Methane? Yeah. At a high temperature, depends on the temperature you run it. it uh, and depends on the uh, flow rate of the uh, methane and the catalyst we use. But for the uh, 10 ml and about one gram of catalyst, it's going to be 100% conversion at about 700 degrees. There are no more questions. Thank you. Huh? Thank you all. speakers in the morning uh, we will meet at 10:45 time for